Oh my gosh. How's everyone doing today? I'm doing fantastic. And you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you, Nidia? Um, I'm great. Um, all the way in Scotland in Edinburgh. And um, yeah, it's a bit cold and windy today and a bit rainy, but um, I'm great. Mm -hmm. I bet you we have you beat on the coldness, though. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Yes. <laughs> I can't compete with you on that one. <laughs> yeah. Do you still have snow on the ground or are you in the clear on that? Um, we don't get as much snow, so yes, we're in the clear, and we don't always get laying snow in Edinburgh. We get in the Highlands, but not in Edinburgh itself. But um, okay. so well, you're definitely you. one one step ahead with the amount of snow you get, <laughs> or one step behind, whatever way you look at it. <laughs> So we wanted to bring you on because you are a change facilitator, facilitator, yes. correct? Yes, I am. So we were hoping to kind of pick your brains about stuff that people can be doing to shift their mindset with everything that they're dealing with right now. Fantastic. And thank you for the opportunity. Yes, I mean, change is a big word. And um, I work a lot of and where I facilitate a lot of my change, change is in corporates and in businesses. Mm -hmm. So that normally brings up a lot of stress and anxiety. And now all of a sudden we are all into stress and anxiety um, because of the worldwide global phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So and the main thing is, is, and I'm sure you guys know, is, is that we, when we go into fight, flight or freeze, it is really difficult to then self-regulate and to um, control our emotions. So for me, it's really important to work with the individual because before I can get them to do anything in the organization, I have to look at where they are and how they're feeling and really meeting them from where they are. And I think that is what we need to do around the world as well. This is we have to meet people of where they are emotionally. And we will all be on a different spectrum and it's a wide spectrum and some be in overwhelm and some will be fine and some will be starting to recover and some people recover quicker than others. But right. there are some techniques as well that we can use to self-regulate and to help us to come out of that overwhelm. But obviously we have to recognize it. And that's most probably the most difficult thing is to get people to recognize, first of all, they are in stress. Right. So when, when people are going through change, scientifically, what is the reason that we feel stress? Well, our bodies are designed to protect ourselves. So we actually just go into a natural defense and the body is just looking out for, uh, for us to make sure that we are safe all the time. So it activates certain um, primitive parts of the nervous system that will then create chemicals, that will create an increase in the heart rate and that is to make us prepare to either run away or we want to fight. Or if it's really bad, we'd rather freeze and play dead. So, okay. so it's super primal. Really, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when we're trying to get people to recognize that they're in stress, and honestly, I have to admit, I, I think I've been in a bit of denial until this week about how stressful this situation has been. So what are the steps that people can go through in order to try to identify stress and then be able to actually deal with it? I think it's when we start looking at our own behaviors and we start recognizing, but I'm actually reacting out of character. So mm -hmm. some of us, um, you know, the fighters will always be a little bit more argumentative. There will be a little bit more conflict. They're a bit stronger on the ego and they're always right. And, you know, they have to get their point across. Mm -hmm. And then our flighters, those are the people who runs away. They don't like conflict. So they would want to go and hide away or they will walk away or they will have a crisis. You know, they, oh, there's always something happening in their life that they don't have to be in the environment of where that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then the freezers are your procrastinators. So they really struggle to do something and they will take weeks and sometimes months before they can get themselves to do things. So mm -hmm. those type of behaviors, and we can see which which part of those three are we. And it's very simplified, if I may say, mm -hmm. but we all fit into one of those categories mainly. And then we will use any one of those categories depending on, on where we are. So when okay. we become aware so of that. Can I, can I ask about let's who, what are each of us? Cause I saw Michael laugh when he's, when you were talking about fighters. So I have a feeling <laughs> there's something that we need to hear from him about. So don't freeze, Michael. <laughs> Very we funny. just like tie the technology together. Um, actually, I was thinking about my son who's a total fighter. And I'm not saying I'm not, but I've been mm. dealing with this 
head on with my son. And actually, this leads into a bit of the question I want to ask you too. I think it's easy to see in other people what their tendencies are. Um, very, very easy. And then if you try to say that to that person, then you get the re whatever their response is of, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess two things. Maybe the most important thing, though, is how do we recognize it in ourselves? What are some things that we can begin to do to self-assess? Am I in a fight, flight, or freeze kind of state? I like to look at who's the people that push my buttons. And when I say push my buttons, it's people who get a reaction from me. Now, I'm a fighter. So um, I'm one of those people who is always right and, you know, like to be controlling. And so I'm a fighter. <laughs> I'm a fighter so, too. Michael, are you yeah, a me fighter? Too. I'm a fighter. Yeah, okay. Oh, great. We have a of fighters. <laughs> oh, no. There's going to be a brawl fest here soon. Yeah, we're super balanced here. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, so I really look at, well, who's the people that push my buttons? And then I'm saying, well, why are, why are they pushing my buttons? Why am I got such a strong reaction? And that's where I start realizing, oops, maybe I'm stressed. Maybe I should look at this because this reaction, the other person is really mirroring for us what we see in ourselves. And that is why they're pushing our buttons. Okay. So if we had, now let's take the next one. So we have our fighter. Now we have our flighter. So if one of us happened to be a flighter, how would our reasoning go with that? Well, they normally stay quiet. They, you know, it's those people who, who won't give you an answer when, when there's conflict. They don't necessarily give you an answer or they will go quiet. Um, so their reaction is a bit more passive um, mm -hmm. and they will avoid things. So they will, they procrastinate to a certain extent as well. Um, but mostly it was like, I'll do it later, or yes, we can talk about it, but we never really get there because they always have something else to do. Okay. And do they go into passive aggressive type tendencies or they just kind of withdraw and get stuck? Some of them can, but but I would say most of them, I would, for me, I think the, the passive aggressive are actually a fighter who have actually had an event in their life where they had to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It pushed down the anger. Okay. You know, so they had to hold back that anger. So that is my experience. Those are your passive aggressives. Okay, interesting. And then what about our freezers? Our freezers are the interesting ones. And I think freezers may be the most uh, unfamiliar with people and sometimes mm -hmm. misunderstood. Um, and I'm sure, as you know as well, is, is that when you go into freeze, that means that you have been so overwhelmed with the emotions of what happened to you that your body literally cannot move. So, and there's a bit of a physiology that happens in your body and, you know, your, your vagus nerve literally starts um, pulling down and start um, lowering your heart rate, which is dangerous because if it goes too low, then it can be fatal. So you have to be careful about that freeze one. And um, I'm also a craniosacral therapist. So we work a lot with um, I do with babies, and especially if there's been trauma in the birth, in birth. So um, that is really that overwhelm. And so sometimes the reactions that we see from people, and you hear a lot of people say, "Well, I don't understand why I didn't react in that situation. You know, mm -hmm. I was completely frozen, and I should have done this, and I could have done that, and I would have done that if I just had the courage." But it's not always that you didn't have the courage. It's just mm -hmm. that your body was protecting yourself and you literally couldn't move. Uh, and that is where a lot of guilt then happens. And then that adds to the trauma that happens. So it's, the freezes are really in overwhelm, but that emotion was just too much for them to handle in the moment. Mm -hmm. Could you unpack a little bit more some really of the typical behaviors you see from freezers, like in more adults or teens that are around us? Because I think the concept makes sense, but practically how do I identify that? Whether it's in myself or someone I care about. Yes, I mean those are are literally the the people that I don't I don't want to do this. I, I really you know they and sometimes I've seen that in my own family as well. Is is when they have got that, the, and if you push too hard, they will come become a bit aggressive. So it is that procrastination of I don't want to do this. I don't feel like it. Um, I don't want to go there. Uh, and then if you push too hard, then that is where the problem comes. So it's a matter of I can't start at. A, 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 um, an activity or something on their own, somebody has to help them to get there or somebody has to help them to start it. So that starting of, of things is really difficult for them. 
That's interesting because like I, I so deal with a lot of competitive dancers and I've got ones who are like, they're fighters, they're going to do whatever it takes to win. And then there's ones who won't practice, but they really want to win, but they're not doing the work to, to actually make that happen. And I'm, that stuff is coming out now with the plague that we're dealing with. Um, so it's really interesting to see how your description of it fits into, like I can pick all these people out of my circle and I'm starting to kind of categorize them around me. So thank you. And what I do is, is because I see that a lot in the corporate world as well. And unfortunately, I mean, I do a lot of technology implementations as well. So when people are scared, they're going to either lose their job or they think that technology is going to take their job. All of those defenses come up. So normally yeah. those procrastinators, you know, you ask them to do something, but they their deadlines are never met uh, or they they perfectionist as well so it's not good enough and they they still have to work on it improve it all the time so what i do with those people is, is i do it with them so i will help them do the task so i will start the task and i will draw out a template of what i of how i want them to complete the template and then i'll do the first one with them so that they can see how it's done and then i'll ask them to continue so that is how the the the, the ways that i have been able to get around and help them to get out of that freeze and that real bog down feeling of I can't get moving. And a lot of it has got to do with there won't be anything coming up. The ideas won't flow for them. And especially if we sit in workshops or we've got design workshops, they feel they're on the spot. And if they can't come up with in, um, ideas, that then increases the, the stress as well, which then brings them further into the freeze. And it's that embarrassed moment of I don't know how to do this. And then it just spirals out of control from there. So really managing freezers is you you have to help guide them to get them started. Um, it's the is that only correct? way I've been able to. How about like if you're doing if because I think if I'm hearing you right, I think all of us, while we have a primary one of these three, we all have tendencies to do each of the three at different times and circumstances. Yeah. So if any one of us finds ourselves personally in a freeze mode, what are some self tricks that we can do to get ourselves going again? Well, the, the main one is, is normally to come back to your breath. <clears throat> and this might sound a bit cheesy or whatever, but you know when people say, <clears throat> just take a breath. Um, yeah. So that really helps. So just taking a breath and then bringing your breathing back into a rhythm where you can breathe, say, for five counts in and five counts out, and you make it a circular breath. So you will count in five and count out five while you breathe in and breathe out. And that sort of helps everything to calm inside and your inside starts calming down. And when you start calming down, then you will feel, okay, new ideas are coming up or maybe I can cope a little bit better. But that is the first step for me to self-regulation is, you know, when you become aware of it, and that is to look at your behavior and then to start feeling what is the sensations I feel in my body. I mean, even, you know, um, being live is a bit um, anxious because it's not something I do on a daily basis. So I've got a bit of an increased heart rate at the moment. So I have to remember to breathe and I have to remember. And you can do that with your eyes open. You know, so I can still do this while I'm talking to you and I can still watch my breathing. And then I can start feeling how I'm feeling. And it gives you space to just think and not be able to react. That's interesting. Like for me, when I get really stressed out, breathing is not where my head goes. I'm like, I need to burn this off. So is there a reason why, like, is it trying to get more oxygen or what, when it, that instinct is to like get super energized and exercise instead of just sitting and trying to be calm? Is there a reason for that? Yes. And, um, I mean, it's it's the science based, and it, the the science has been done by the HeartMath Institute. So they have done a lot of research, and they have found that if you bring your heart and your brain into coherence, so that is the frequencies in your brain and the frequency in your heart, and your breath helps to actually bring those two into coherence, so that they go on the same rhythm. Mm -hmm. And when that rhythm comes back into coherence, that is when you start regulating and you can calm down. Okay. That brings you back into performance again. So that's also the technique that they teach people, like people in the um, health industry or in military, that is how they self-regulate. So when they have to be at their top performance, that is how they self-regulate. Interesting. Breath work. Breath work. You have to okay. learn how to breathe properly. Which seems like it should just be inherent, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's yeah. not. 
<laughs> yes, but I think we know we don't really get taught because it's so automatic, it's so part of our lives that we don't have to think about it. And I don't think that this knowledge is out there in our schools or in our everyday life, in our social life. Um, it is something that needs to be taught. And um, yeah. the science of it is really helping to make that a lot more mainstream now. Mm -hmm. I thought they were starting to bring heart math into maybe some of the private schools or whatnot, because I remember hearing about it quite a lot about a decade ago. And then it wasn't actually till you and I had our conversation last week. And then the next day I had someone else, I had a conversation with her and she talked about hard math. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting how that comes together, like hit after hit, but I hadn't heard about it for so long before that. Yes, I mean, they've been going for a long time. They were they were formed in, in the 90s and they've done lots of research. Um, and so um, they're also doing a lot of work with various organisations. Um, and so I'm, I'm aware of some of the research and some of the work they've done with the types of organisations that I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing as well is, is therapists like me are starting to use that with our clients and we're seeing the the results that it's giving our clients and so from that perspective when people see the results as well it helps and, and more and more therapists doesn't want people to become dependent on them we do want to empower them so that they can look after their own health and mm -hmm. that is de definitely what the techniques that the heart math um, teaches us and um, does mm -hmm. now like right now Yes, there's some people who are unemployed. There's some people who are facing massive business decisions. Like in the dental world, we're going, we don't know when these dentists are going to get to go back to work, right? And so it's not just they're scared of what's happening with the virus. It's fear that they're not going to be able to keep a roof over their heads. They're not going to be able to provide for their families. They don't know if they're yeah. going to have a profession really to come back to in, yeah. in the way that they expected it, um, the way that they've learned to come to expect from themselves and from the profession. So for people who are dealing with that kind of uncertainty, what can they be doing to try and unpack the situation, to try and understand it with the information that they have in that moment, even though we know there's more information to come that we can, we're gonna be waiting on, but how can they be dealing better with it in that moment? Cause there is honestly so much uncertainty and Michael is still in clinical practice here. So he's uh, right in the mud with everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's a nice way of saying mud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, and, and it sounds, <clears throat> it will sound a lot easier than it is. I know how difficult it is because when we are so stressed, unfortunately, when you get all those chemicals in your body, it's really difficult to see positive opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that is why the self-regulation is so important that for a couple of seconds at least or a couple of minutes or five minutes a day, you can just bring your body back to where your brain can actually find solutions. You know, we've got this beautiful part of the brain, which is the frontal lobe, which actually helps us to solve problems. And that is one quality that we have as human beings is that we've got the ability to solve a problem. And our brains do that for us when we just ask the questions. So when we ask a question about, you know, where will I go next or what will happen? If I then go quiet and can reduce the stress in my body, sometimes you'll get ideas, but the best way then is to connect with people, to really form masterminds, to form working groups, to form and start talking to people. And that is the process which I love the most about my work is that creative process is when you work on a problem together and you're all asking that same question, it's amazing the solutions that come. So mm -hmm. if you actually withdraw from everything and everybody, that is when the stress escalates. So it's very important to connect with people and to look for solutions together because mm -hmm. we will come to that solutions together and that's what our brains do. So that is our body's way of helping us to come out of that fight, flight and freeze so is we can bring it down and then the solutions come if we ask questions because our frontal lobe really loves solving problems. So give it something to solve. Yes. Now, when you're dealing with like super proud people, like dent dentists are pretty <laughs> type A. And so for them to actually let down that guard and go, this is what I'm actually dealing with. We see that a lot of times they just try and maintain great, like perfect appearances for their colleagues. And they don't want to admit how awful things are 
how do you get people wrapping their mind around they need to let that go in order to move into what you just talked about? Yes, and I mean, that is very difficult, especially for A-type people, because you always want to be in control and you're always, you always, you know, that's all the thing about uncertainty is we don't like to be out of control. And unfortunately, when you let go, it will feel out of control because it's unfamiliar. But when you're in that unfamiliar, that is the creative process. It, it will be will be difficult and it will be things that they will have to take maybe small steps. So they might have to go there and then it becomes too uncomfortable. Then they have to distract themselves to go and do something and then come back. But the more they do it, the more it will become familiar and the easier it will become. But it's not to do it overnight and to do it too quickly is also not not advisable. So, and you know, it's a very much, and it's a pity I don't have one of those um, <clears throat> frizzy drinks. So if you've got a frizzy drink, you know, and, and it's, it's still in a seal and you shake it, it is really going to, if you shake it too much, it's going to explode. And so if you shake it, you, and before you open the top, you know, you have to take that top off very slowly to release the pressure. Now, that is what you want to do with fear and overwhelm. And when you're uncertain about things, you have to do the same. So when you go into that, do it with small steps and small chunks and only as much as you can go and take emotionally. But the main thing is, is you have to surround, engage with people. Find the people you trust and it's better to start on a one-to-one. -one. So go to your best friend or, you know, a business coach or somebody that you really trust and then start that one-to-one -one conversation where you can start looking for how can I see possibilities? What do you see? What can I see? I'm thinking like this. Maybe we can put it together. And then you put another person in the mix and another person in the mix until you've got a group of four or six where you can then work together. Right. That's interesting because a lot of the people who start like with the business coaching side with me will end up in our masterclass series and then they start opening up. If we try and throw them right into the masterclass series, they're the ones hiding at the back of the room, hoping nobody notices them and that, hoping that we don't ask them questions where they're going to have to reveal themselves. But if they've had that one-on-one -on -one time to unpack a lot of this stuff and really understand what's going on, then they're more likely to get comfortable in that kind of group situation where they can let their guard down and say, hey, sometimes life sucks and it's not always perfect like we want it to be. So yeah, fascinating. Yes, and when people also, I think for me as well, it's when I when I understood, well, most of the things is really just in my mind that I think I am so different from anybody else and I'm the only one experiencing it until I speak to people and then I realize, oops, but they're thinking the same way. And, and I'm sure if we start talking because we're all three fighters, we most probably will think the same things, you know, and we will have the same ego issues and we will have the same thing. So, and then I realize, oh, I I'm don't. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so special, you know, after all, I'm just like everybody else and then it becomes easier. Right. So we're all in the same boat together, hoping that, that it doesn't sink. <laughs> well, you know what, it, it's, it's if, we, if we actually make a decision together that we are going to get this boat out of it and we're going to do it together, you know, if we have to take the boat out, we're going to need a bit more than three people. So we're going to have to take the people <laughs> with us that's when we can come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because before this happened, like there was so much competition in the market and people were really just trying to take care of themselves. Now that we're in this and everyone is starting to realize, okay, yeah, I'm having financial problems and so is the rest of the world. So we're all in this together. We're starting to see the world come together to actually collaborate, whether it comes to the science for research and development for the vaccine or funding for relief financially and all this stuff. Um, why weren't we seeing this before? Why did we have to have such a massive health crisis happen to get people to actually pull together? Because we don't choose to change. We, you know, change is difficult for us. And then that's, and like I said before, it's because it's, it's, we get up against oh, yeah. our own bodies. Um, when we do things over and over, over a long period of time, we have conditioned our body to do better than to do things better than when what our minds can actually do. And I can think of an example for for instance, is so many times you will um, 
do your telephone number on a phone, but you will do it so many times that you don't have to think about it. And over a period of time, you actually forgot and you can't remember the number. But when you do it on the phone, you can still dial the number. Now, that is already in your subconscious mind. So your body knows better how to do it mm -hmm. than your mind does. And now it's subconscious. I don't even know I'm doing it. So that happens a lot when I go into organizations to work with them. And I do a lot of process improvements. And um, the people can, when we put them in a workshop, they will tell me what they do. But there's a lot of stuff they, they don't even know they do. Then I go and sit next to them and I observe them. <clears throat> then I recognize all these other things. And then when I ask them about it, they literally cannot remember that they've done it because it's all subconscious. Huh. So when our bodies know better how to do things than our mind, it's really difficult for us to change. So sometimes you have to wait for a crisis, and unfortunately mm -hmm. most of us wait for that. Or otherwise you have to consciously make a decision I want to change. This behavior is not working for me. And unfortunately, that's not a natural tendency for humans. So is it fair then to say that most of the change has to then happen at a more subconscious level, <clears throat> if that's where so much of our activity happens, I mean, in terms of actual physical action? And then if that's the case, what are some things you can suggest that begin to get to that part of our minds that controls our body, as you call it, like a body intelligence, so to speak? Um, how do we how do we start changing that, manipulating that in a direction that we want to go? Well, first of all, you have to become aware of what you're doing unconsciously. So it becomes a self-observation tool. And the best way to do that, and that is what we are doing right now because we're all in lockdown. So we have to observe ourselves and then to become still. Uh, you know, we are very good at distracting ourselves. So when it becomes uncomfortable, we go and run or we go and do an activity or we go and see a friend <coughs> or we go and buy something, you know. <laughs> Guilty. I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting. <laughs> I totally know I'm fighting. I'm just not admitting it until now. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> So we I'm have trying to, to interrupt. become still. No, 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 not at all. We have to become still and we have to take that time to become still. And then we obviously have to decide, well, okay, what do I want? So you then have to say, what is my future going to look like? How am I going to get there? And then you have to work with yourself and you obviously everything happens with a thought. So, you, you know, your thought is as well, what do I want? Where am I going? And then you have to do the actions that's going to take you there, but you have to do it also over a long period of time to break the old habits and create new habits. So then you will create a new unconscious. And once you've created that new unconscious, you will be your new self. That makes it sense. It sounds so easy when you say it like that. Oh, I know. <laughs> Ooh, tell me about it. My God, I've been working at this for like intentionally for five years. I don't really know that. I... <laughs> I'm a very stubborn person and boy, that is a difficult process. Mm -hmm. But your accent makes you seem like you're not. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, I'm extremely stubborn. Yeah. And uh, our logical people, and I'm also a business analyst. So my analytical mind always takes over. So to get breakthrough, your analytical mind really takes intention and hard work. So you have mm -hmm. to work at it. It's not something that's going to come natural. You have to stand in the uncomfortable to become comfortable with the future. Mm -hmm. And that is where dancing is good, Angela. I mean, I'm, I also love my dancing. But because of the repetition, it's a great way to create new habits is that whole repetition thing. And that is where physical things like sports people, dancers, you know, singers, um, piano players, orchestra or musical players, those people, because they know what, how to rehearse, they know how to repeat things. In the business world, we, we're not taught how to rehearse and how to do things over and over until we know how to do it properly. We think we have to know it the first time and we just have to know things. But it's when you do those physical things when you realize, but I have to work at this. I have to rehearse. I have to practice. And everything in the world, in life is like that. Right. No, that makes good sense. And it, it really is true, especially if you have become an entrepreneur based on you were really good at something and so you try to make it your profession, you 
a lot of times we're not taught how to do anything and you can read business books and whatnot, but that, that practicing to be good at things and be really competent at it is something that I think a lot of times we don't do because, well, for one thing, there's ego in there, but it's also, we, we, don't, we aren't told that that's what we need to be doing. So yeah, that's really, that's fascinating. It's very Can I ask a paradoxical question? And I'm really curious to hear your thought on this is, I, 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 Angela's gonna laugh at me, but I always write down notes when we have our guests on. Totally I, always find, <laughs> I always find so many of the things that you share to be fascinating. I'm like, I wanna think about that for longer. And you said to learn to become, learning to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. And then you also talked about repetition being a, one of the most uh, convincing ways to train the subconscious mind. So what can we do to train the subconscious mind then to become comfortable with the uncomfortable? Like what are some actions that are maybe not like the big ones that we have to change, but some small ones so that we simply become more familiar with the uncomfortable and it's less scary? Well, what I do is, is an, and it's a trick that, or it's not a trick, it's a technique we use in the business world quite a lot, is, is that it's planning. So you have to plan where are you going. And once you know where you're going, you then work backwards to say, how do I have to go from where I am now to where I want to go? <clears throat> so then you work backwards to say, well, what is the steps I have to take that's going to take me there? And then I have to do them. And that, But the difficult part is, is doing them because I'm not going to feel like it. And when, it, when I do them, I'm not good at it. So my ego gets in the way. And that is that chemical reaction in the body that's resisting because it still wants to have its chemical fix. So you that is the uncomfortable part which you have to break. And mm -hmm. um, let me admit, I mean, I'm a sugar, a sugar addict. I absolutely love sugar. And um, it's been a thing for me to try and break my sugar addiction. And it's the same thing, you know. And um, every day, and it's amazing because somebody sent me a, a parcel the other day and all it had was chocolate. And it had all the best chocolates that you can think of that I like was in this package. And it's still sitting in my cupboard, but I've been able to resist it for three days. Mm -hmm. But that is because I've been able to break that chemical addiction. But for to get there, I had to be strong. There was times when I was standing in that cupboard, having the chocolate in my hand, and then putting it back and saying, no, not today. So that is the uncomfortable. So you have to do whatever you need to do. So if I want to break my sugar addiction, I have to stop eating or taking sugar. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I have to do it. And it's that uncomfortableness, and that is what makes it so difficult because, you know, I lie in bed and I'm thinking about the chocolates in the cupboard and I'm doing this and I'm thinking about the chocolates in the cupboard. But eventually when you actually break through that cold turkey, it will become easier. And if you then get those wins and I'm starting to feel the reaction in my body, I'm feeling a lot better. So that is now giving me the motivation to keep on going to break my sugar addiction. <laughs> Interesting. Your dentist must be so proud. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know about that. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Michael, do you have any questions before we wrap up today? No, I, I'm I, just writing my notes. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good student. There's, there's a term that, uh, that I've used to describe what you talked about that I've heard used a lot of circles is reverse engineered production. Oh, okay. That's a nice way. That's a one I'll take from you now. Okay. I'll make <laughs> a note idea, now. Yeah, that idea of imagining what the final product is like and then what are the steps I have to take to get there and now that's what I do going forward. Yes. I like that. Uh, Good and, job, and I, Michael. <laughs> well, it wasn't my idea. I've heard other people say that. So Just take some the of the, the my biggest Okay. <laughs> awesome. My well, I have well, I have to say, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here and I know you're a busy lady and um, your knowledge share has been amazing today. So I really do appreciate you coming on and, and chatting with us. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. It was lovely uh, being on your show and I enjoyed talking to you. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. I hope to see you again very soon. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.